five. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa, Whoa, hold on. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) All right, we're okay now. All right. We're in the green room with Roger Smith. Okay, so thank you everybody for bearing with us. We are live and uh, there are people are tuning in and everybody's probably wondering, where are you? Why (laughs) don't we have your keyboard? And uh, it's a Well, I have something just as good. (laughs) <laughs> perfect you know we can jump right into that if you want so i have you sent me so many pictures and and of the winery and uh, uh pictures of you with tower and i don't even know where to start uh other than um i think what i'd like to know because i've only known known you from the tower days and you sent me some pictures of and i'm not quite sure um who who some of the, there was a picture and you may not be able to see it unless you have the facebook uh up there but uh, let's see here uh let me um i've got a, i pulled a picture up and it, it's a picture of um what did you label that as can you see that yet uh it's not we have a little delay so it's coming oh, it's coming yeah. it's coming um who did you say that was Oh, oh, that's Blind Melon. Blind Melon. Yeah. Now, now, did you play with him? I, I, I started that band. Oh, <laughs> well, so. But when... uh, let me explain. Please. Okay. Uh, let me turn this up a little bit. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Blind Melon. Uh, let's see. I think that was 1970 or 71. Um, and uh, uh, it was myself. Um uh, J. Aaron Podolnik, Kyle Brock, Keith Newberry, and uh, about a 15, 16 year old Eric Johnson on guitar. Mm. And uh, we started the band Blind Melon. And Tomas, Tomas Ramirez was on saxophone. Um, uh, it kind of got, I won't get into much over over the air because there's a lot of litigation about the name, um, mm. but um, it's not the pop group that you're thinking of but the name is the same and so there was some litigation and um a few court dates and uh i won but you know <laughs> so anyhow that's long and short of it right okay yeah. so yes that's that's the group um that uh that's the group that we started back then uh, and we were playing at the Armadillo World Headquarters in Austin, Texas. I think we were opening for uh, Mahavishnu. Whoa! Yeah, the 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 original. I think it was was it, I think it was Mahavishnu. I think that's who it was. With Billy Cobham. Yes. Wow. And J- Jan Hammer, the the first in um, the first uh, amalgamation of that group. So. This is the kind of stuff that if I were sitting, we were sitting around ready for the show to go on, I would be wanting to know this about you. Where is? Did you grow up in Texas? Oh, no, I grew up here in California. However, uh, I was born in Dallas. Um, all of my, uh, my mom, my dad, all my cousins, everybody else, uh, we, they were all raised in Texas. My folks moved with me out of Texas. I think I was about three or four. And uh, went to um, Hobbs, New Mexico from Hobbs. We moved into California. And I've uh, pretty much been here all of my life from um, elementary school till now. <laughs> and, and, and where is it? Northern California, the uh, Bay Area, Sacramento? Uh, well, basically, we started in the um, Imperial Valley down way down below uh, 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 Fresno, California mm-hmm. and Kingsburg, a little bitty town called uh, New London. At that time, it was a sharecropper community. My folks literally picked cotton by hand, just like you see in the pictures. 
For all you too young to understand what that's about, there was no machinery. There were people carrying a long bag up to 10 feet long, packing it with cotton. And that's what my mom and dad did for a short while. You know, and uh, uh, we left, uh, that's right down there in the valley. Uh, just like I say, was, yeah, Hanford, Dinuba, Visalia, uh, all back down in there. Uh, really rich uh, agricultural area. And that's where I kind of started growing up at. And then from there, we left and moved up to Kingsburg where my mom and dad got great jobs and they worked and worked and worked and went to school and studied. We moved up to Sacramento where my mom got her uh, uh, nursing degree and uh, dad uh, was a full-time mechanic. And I've been here in Sacramento since, oh, I'd say I was about eight, eight or eight or nine years old. I've been in Sacramento. And uh before I ask you the next question, I think a lot of people don't know how big the, the cotton market is in California. There's a lot of cotton grown in California. Uh, yes, very much so. A lot of it's been taken over by grapevines. Oh. But um, especially down the valley, you'll see where Gallo and uh, a couple of the other uh, large, when large companies have uh, taken over a lot of those fields. Uh, then some of the industrial farmers have a lot of cotton, cotton, and um, oh, what else? Uh, rice and different stuff like that that they grow uh, down the valley. But yeah, cotton was a, a main staple yeah. for a long time. You'd see cotton gins and all kinds of stuff around there. My dad drove for one of the big cotton mills in Kingsburg, and when I was a kid, I used to ride in the truck with him, uh, at, you know, to take it over to the uh, processing place where they would actually separate the cotton from the seeds that is uh that's that's rough work <laughs> yep <laughs> when so when you went to uh sacramento uh and you were you said like eight or nine when did you start playing keys and, and get involved in music oh man that that came way after it never was a a thing with me where i was going to be a musician never thought of myself like that uh that didn't, uh, there was no interest in music with me until we got to Sacramento. I think I was about 11 years old, 10, I was 10, 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. uh, my neighbor, uh, Ronald McGriff, uh, his uncle was the late great Jimmy McGriff. Uh, and in Sacramento, there were a lot of places to play at that time for jazz musicians, lots of clubs. Clubs abound here in this town, believe it or not. And a lot of groups would come in like, um, oh, let's see, B.B. King would play here. James Brown came through. I can't count the amount of times. Um, um, Bobby Blue Bland. Um, uh, um, oh, geez. <laughs> a lot of the old uh, R&B soul singers, Brooke Benton, uh, Ike and Tina Turner, uh, so many of them. Uh, anyway, and there were a lot of organ trios that would come in. Jack, uh, uh, McDuff, McGriff, Jimmy Smith, who eventually lived here for a while and mentored me, fast forward. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so I got to watch Ron's uncle, Uncle Jimmy, <laughs> uh, practice at his house. He had, he had a Hammond B3 there. At that time, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a church organ, mm -hmm. but I've never heard a church organ sound like that before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just gave me chill bumps. And uh, Jimmy taught me my first two songs, Down the Road of Peace and Little Red Rooster. And I've not been the same since. Oh, and, and you got the bug and then it was just off to the races. Yeah, it was off to the races. I had a little hiccup here there because my mom was devoutly religious and mm -hmm. uh, I was not going to play that devil music in her house. So oh, really? <laughs> it took a little while. <laughs> so so then uh, you, you kept playing, and what was the first band you played in? And and um, when did you become fascinated with, And because this will tie us into what you're doing now, mm -hmm. when did Tower of Power come on your radar? Oh, man. Okay, backing up, when did I get, become fascinated with playing in a band? The very first group um, was a group, Oh man, I think I was, uh, oh, I might've been in ninth grade uh, and I had a Farfisa organ a group called Milk here in Sacramento. Um, 
uh, some guys that I went to high school with, I couldn't play at all. They just put up with me. <laughs> kind of like what Tower Power is doing now. No. No. <laughs> but so uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, I had fun doing it. I, I, I knew a couple of songs. Yeah, what was it? Um, oh, man, I'm trying to think of some of the tunes we used to do back then. Uh, they were doing a lot of beach songs like Jan and Dean. Uh, the Beach Boys and stuff like that. Um, I think the only soul tune we did, oh, what was it? I can't even remember. It's been so long ago. I mean, I was in the ninth grade, so. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was my first taste of it, you know, with a little organ, which wasn't taken seriously because I was a kid, you know, didn't know anything, uh, anything about what I was doing and what I wanted to do at that time, just have fun. And besides that, all the young junior high girls were really into guys that played music. So that was one of the reasons that I wanted to be in it. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, from then, um, I really didn't pursue any music too much at all, Jeff. Um, nothing really came around seriously until, oh man, uh, later in life, uh, there was a group in town. Uh, my good friend is called Strength. Um, and that's when I met my Soul Train partners. Uh, and uh, I learned a lot from that band. It was a top 40 R&B band back then. And um, so I started really getting into it more. Uh, not as much for a living, other than it was just for fun, because... I was working, uh, had a straight job pretty much after school and all of the different kind of things. Um, but that was kind of like me cutting teeth and kind of like understanding the groove, you know, what a groove was, how to interact with different players, even though it wasn't my vocation at the time, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So did you always just play organ? Did you do piano or any other? Piano. Music? It was piano. Uh, piano Rhodes, I even messed around with a lot of upright bass at the time and vibraphone. Um, yeah. But uh, the piano was my mainstay. Uh, organ came later. Uh, the great Newell Burton really turned me around playing organ. Um, and like I say, Jimmy McGriff and all of them. Uh, never, you know, the organ still is something that really just makes the hair stand up. Uh, you know, not up here, but <laughs> down my neck. <laughs> so, so you're you were playing a lot of top forty and R and B and that sort of thing. But was that sort of how you cut your teeth on that style of music, or were you uh, more influenced by jazz people? Mostly by R and B, blues, blues, R and B. Uh, jazz came a little later. I was very intrigued with it, very enamored by it, but I didn't understand it because I couldn't read. Um, and really didn't take the time at that particular moment to really get into the theory of music. Uh, I still struggle with it. I'm not a great reader. Uh, the mathematics of music still gives me fits. Uh, if I can hear it and what I'm hearing is moving me, in other words, if I can feel it, I can play it uh, and find a part. What, what I what I have heard, and what I especially when I was out there sitting on the other side of the stage from you, is is the the feel that you have and how you you emit this the groove you were talking about that that just comes emanates from you, and and that's you don't need to be able to read music to do that. And a lot of people learn yeah. music and do that, get that feel, get that groove going. Right. So, yeah, it's, you know, I, it's one of those things where, you know, like it's I, I even from you know my younger days and, and listen to the guys like Larry Bradford, Newell Burton and those guys play. They weren't playing with music sheets in front of their face. They weren't counting a one in a two in a three in a four in a oh, it's on the end of one and a four. No, it was all feel every bit of it. You know, you right. play it from here. It wasn't coming from here. It was coming from here, inside. Right. And uh, 
if it wasn't coming from there, speaking for me personally, from those guys, the the, the um, lessons and the understanding that I got from him, them, was to get out of my own head and just f- play me. Right. Uh, and it took me a while to understand that with him because they'd be playing and and I, I'd go to school sometimes and I'd, I'd watch these other band members like stage band. They had charts and mm-hmm. I couldn't read the charts, but. You know, I was wondering, well, they're reading it, but everything was going, da, 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 ba, 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 ya, ba, da, ba, da, just perfectly executed, but with no soul. Right. And that's that turned me off from day one. And I appreciate guys that can read and do that stuff and emulate a feel once they get the chart down. Um, that just hasn't been me. I'm the guy that has to start with the feel first. Then I'll take a look at the chart if I can understand it. To right. say, oh, that's what that is. That's what that is. Yeah. But I already have a feel for the for the music, and that's the way it is with Tower of Power. Uh, uh, like uh, you have a a genius like David Garibaldi on the drums. Oh, <laughs> um, and he'll he'll look over and tell me it's just on the end of two. It's the end of two. I said, No, Dave. I said the end of nothing. Just play the thing <laughs> so I can feel it. You know, you guys just play it. I'll get my part because I don't want to have to think in terms of numbers or counting or trying to subdivide in my head while I'm trying to perform it. That right. just uh, it, that's oil and water to me, man. You know? So before you get to Tower of Power, though, what, what was your first major act? What was the first thing that you did that was was, wow, I can't believe I'm doing this. Uh, the late Freddie King. Freddie King. That was my very first act. And that came uh, during the time I was with uh, Blind Millen when I had that band together. Mm-hmm. And and then after that, uh, Tom texted something uh, to me uh, about Gladys Knight. Tell me about Gladys Knight. Well, Gladys came way after that. So there um, was stuff in between Gladys and... and where- yeah, Gl- Gladys came... <laughs> It, it things were really rolling fast. Uh, there, there was about a seven year, eight year period that this, 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 this. I'd step over here and I was in the middle of that. Uh, it's, it's, for instance, um, Jerry Jeff Walker, mm-hmm. uh, the country artist. Um, I happened to step into the studio that we built while in Austin. There was a place called Odyssey Sound. Uh, me, Tomas, all of us, we built that place. And it was a very famous uh, studio there in Austin for a long, a lot of years, right there on West 6th Street, which is no longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I stepped into the studio and there's Jerry Jeff in there. And he looked at me and said, hey, you want to pick? And I never heard that term. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll pick. <laughs> so I went in there and I wound up, you know, on a record with Jerry Jeff Walker. Uh, it, 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 that's the way things happened. Uh, when I played uh, with Freddie King, uh, Willie Nelson was out in the audience right there at the Armadillo World Headquarters. And uh, my name bounced around and wound up in Jeff Beck's lap. Uh, wow. Got to play with him. My name bounced around and wound up in Harvey Mandel's lap. We went out with Jeff Beck for six weeks with the Harvey Mandel band. Open for him during the, uh, was it the Blow by Blow? Blow by Blow uh, record. That was uh, and it was uh, amazing. But to answer your question, what I'm trying to say is like, uh, it's hard for me to chronicle, you know, put it in a chronological order because it all happened, uh, you know, within a matter of eight to 10 years. So much stuff when I was a young man, um, I would say from 20 to 30, that just, I, you know, it's a blur. Yeah. But uh, it, it's a, it sounded like you just went out there or you were playing and you had the feel and then all of a sudden the, the work came to you and more than likely because of the feel that you have. Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to think so. Um, I, a lot of the times, most of the times I was real hesitant because I wasn't too secure in my ability to pull off a gig. And, you know, it's, you know, a little instability there because I don't read. Uh, when I got the gig with Gladys Knight, um, the leader of uh, the the head of the Sacramento Orchestra Symphony here in town in Sacramento um, uh, needed a keyboardist to play with Gladys Knight. And uh, name is Stan Lanetta. His son is famous trumpeter, 
Larry Lanetta. And oh. I'm sure Tommy knows Larry Lanetta. Sure. And uh, so Larry talked his dad into getting me on that gig with Gladys. Uh, that was at Concord Pavilion. Um, so I went in with my tuxedo with the rest of the orchestra, you know, 30 piece orchestra, man. And I was in the pit with Gladys and um, I brought my clavinet, brought my Rhodes and set up everything. We didn't rehearse. We just went over the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I couldn't read, but I knew the music. Mm. So I, I just knew it. I, everybody knows Gladys Knight stuff. Right. Um, so uh, her whole set list, 90% of it, I had played countless times. Um, and uh, so we're up there playing and on the, uh, I think it was, um, was it Heard It Through the Grapevine? I think that was the last tune, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were doing the the ride out, you know, they were saying goodbye and all that kind of stuff. And, the, and we're up there and I, I'm jamming with the band and I had my clavinet. So I jumped on clavinet and I started playing the thing. And uh, and the three guys that were, that were the members of Gladys's band, that's, she only had three people mm -hmm. other than the Pips. And they hired the orchestra and a pianist in every city. Um, so I was a hired pianist. So I'm jamming on clavinet and they never had a clavinet on stage with them. And we're doing this thing. And um, Bubba was up there doing, you know, they were doing their, their dances and their steps, you know, yeah. and Bubba went left when he should have went right. Oh, <laughs> totally screwed up the whole thing. Gladys stopped the band and, um, and said, okay, uh, <laughs> blah 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 this is what we're gonna have you know what happened uh bubba turned around and pointed at at the pit oh what's wrong with you bubba yeah all these years she made a you know she's such a pro and the audience was just dying laughing thinking that was part of the show mm -hmm. points right down there the spotlights right on me oh, oh no. i thought i was done man oh. <laughs> career's over I'm, I'm done i screwed this all up oh. you know head hung down oh. almost in tears because I, I didn't get it. I, I didn't get any of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the or orchestra didn't either. They're up there tapping on their violins. Right. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> you know? And uh, at the end of the night, um, I'm packing up, getting ready to leave and feeling like just dog crap. Uh -huh. And uh, the uh, road manager for Gladys comes up and he says, well, what are you doing tomorrow, man? <laughs> so what do you mean? He says, "Won't you meet us down in San Diego?" What? Use me exactly. What? <laughs> and uh, I took a chance. They, they didn't give me a ticket. I bought a ticket, uh, and I flew down. Just yeah, you know why not? Yeah. Uh, and so I flew down there, and they had my room ready and everything. And I played at um, well, back then it was Charger Stadium. Charger Stadium, yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, on that bill, the, on the tour package was Gladys. She was headliner. Mm -hmm. George Duke was an 18-year-old oh. um, Sheila E. in the band. Oh. Uh, LTD uh, with the uh, Jeffrey Osborne still singing lead. Uh, Al Jarreau and Frankie Beverly and Mays, the original. Oh my. And that was a tour package. And Gladys oh. was the headliner for that tour package. So we did that night and uh, I was all happy. It went pretty well. So I'm ready to go home, ready to fly home the next day. And he said, oh no, you're gonna go, we're heading up to, uh, we're gonna play Mile High in Denver. Oh, okay, well, I was getting ready to buy another ticket. Oh no, no, we got a ticket for you. So the rest was history. And then you, the, you it's your gig. Yeah, it was, short, it was short lived, but it was great, you know. And, and so, uh, how long was that before Tower of Power? When did how? Oh, did that was way. Oh, godly! That we're talking seventies, wow. late seventies and eighty, uh, and early eighties. So, so what? But, <laughs> I just get my. I mean, you've had such a history already, and we're only to the seventies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, right. So, when did you get start doing Tower? I didn't start doing. I say, well, I first heard Tower, of course. Uh, uh geez man uh this is post army and uh this is just when i was starting uh blind melon and i was turning all those guys on to uh east bay grease record and uh, when it first came out and i'd heard these guys prior i heard these guys the very first time i heard them was in was it 70 69 or 70 and uh 
I, I went back to hear him three or four times. Uh, see, I think I heard him once at, uh, God, what was that, Frenchie's? And once at uh, a place over there on Broadway. I think it was on Broadway, I think. Yeah. And um, I was blown away. I'd never seen a group of white boys play that funky. Right. <laughs> to be honest, that I had to go back and see them again, you know. Right. And uh, they've been a part of my DNA since seeing seeing them for the first time, to be honest. Um, and I turned everybody on to them uh, when I was down in Austin. As a matter of fact, we all went to San, uh, what was it? Uh, San Antonio. I think it was 1971, maybe? 72, 71, 72. And they were opening for Creedence Clearwater Revival. Oh my God. And here, a bunch of us hippies walking into this, at that time, there was a number of rednecks in there. It's a big auditorium down there and a big stadium and uh, arena, I'm sorry. And, and here we come walking in, long haired hippies and you know, the whole nine yards. And, uh, and the lights were bright as the sun on it. And Tower was up there playing. They were getting booed like crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> oh it was scary. It was it was scary, man. It was like, wow, these guys are, can't they hear them? And they, they, the boos and, and the people were talking over them. They didn't want to hear them. They want to hear Credence. And Tower piled through it. But you really couldn't get a sense of them. Because right. you got 10,000 people, or, you know, however many people were there, booing. Yeah. You know, oh, Creedence, why well, I have Creedence, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I was in love with those guys from day one, man. And, um, you know, um, as 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 luck would have it, you know, as Norbert Stachel, uh, he was the one who gave me that call. And mind you, Norbert's sax player, he used to be the lead, lead tenor player with Tower. Um, he was on a couple of my records already. Mm -hmm. And he called me up out of the blue and he says, hey man, you know, I think they're looking for an organ player. Would you be interested? Uh, yeah, sure. I was playing up in Lake Tahoe. We had a house gig up there, uh, back up a little bit. The band I was with is called Sunbear, or it was a Soul Train band. Uh, we were hired, uh, we were signed to Solar Records and uh, Soul Train Records back in the day. And we were the backup band and uh, rehearsal band for the Whispers, Kerry Lucas, Shalimar, all those big hits. We would carve those songs out. We were the B band. Then they'd hire the A band to cut the songs, mm. you know. But uh, yeah, we, we were the we were the schleppers for uh, Soul Train. Uh, so uh, Mimi, Dave, and uh, uh, Jeff Tamalier came oh. over to the Christiana Lodge uh, where we were playing to hear me play. And uh, I got a call and uh, invited me down uh, to the Bay Area to uh, audition again, which I didn't mind because, okay, that's right down the street. Right. Uh, they changed it to LA, Jeff. And that's when I kind of paused because that would mean I'd have to come out of pocket to fly down there, fly back or stay down there and come back. And that was more money than I cared to spend. Mm -hmm. So I bailed on it and they got another organ player get a call from Dave Garibaldi maybe a week later said hey man would you mind coming jamming with me and uh, Rocco and Jeff at my house in Livermore I went <coughs> excuse me um, absolutely uh, so I packed up my little stuff went down to Dave's house and we jammed and uh, had a good time Dave goes can you come back tomorrow I said absolutely came back the next day we jammed and uh, we're talking and I'm in Dave's kitchen Dave gets on the phone he calls Emilio, and I'm quoting. He says, Emilio, it's Dave. We have our organ player. <laughs> and I don't remember what was said after that. I really don't. <laughs> and uh, I've been with the band since 99, 98, somewhere, a long time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That, that's such a great story. So what I, and Here's. I had this to Tom the other night and to uh, Jerry, uh, and anybody, I thought, you know, the 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 book of music that, that comes from Tower of Power, and I've always been a fan, and you are a fan, and Tom is a fan, and and it's it's almost like when you watch the band play, 
everybody is a fan of the music they're playing. It's, it's like as you watch everybody, it makes all of you guys playing. You're you're such a fan of the music itself that it's fun and it it has a life of its own that everybody just sort of participates in. It, 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 am I describing that sort of accurately? No, you're, you're describing it to a T. We take so much pride to a man in that band uh, to execute this stuff as best we can to keep the footprint there, but at the same time have a little bit of our own personality in there. But right. the priority is to keep the footprint. You lose the footprint, you lose the band. The band, you know, the music's not there. The soul of the band's not there if you lose the footprint. Right. So <clears throat> what is hip? Uh, so very hard to go. That footprint has to stay there. You can't just take it and flip it and call yourself Tower of Power. It just doesn't happen. Um, uh, so to a man, I, I, I can speak for them all, I, you know, Doc Emilio, notwithstanding, and Dave. Right. But the other seven of us, uh, we take pride in executing that and keeping that footprint. And that's prideful to us, you know. Um, every night we get on stage, no matter how tired we are, it's to bring it. It's to bring it to the fullest of our capabilities, you know. Absolutely. And and from the, the short time I did, it was that's the way the band was. It's like every night is, I'm pardon the expression, this balls to the wall. Yeah, it's, it is. It, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, it's we're do it's our gig, it's our job, it's our obligation. Right? That is uh, correct, man. That is you're absolutely correct. Um there's um you know, there's no other way to put it that uh, I think there's a misconception with some of the players who aren't that familiar with Tower Power that this is something we can just knock out and do. No. no. <laughs> it, it 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 may be you know, like when I teach some of the kids how to play, I, I, I've taught some great players, man. I mean, excellent technicians, theoreticians. They play their butts off. Yeah. But when I said, okay, I want you to play um, what is hip? How would you approach what is hip? Uh -huh. And it all over the map, man. I said, I'll tell you what, sit on your left hand. Okay. Make, uh, make the chord you're playing with everybody just a three-finger chord. Simple. How would you voice that? What's the guitar player playing? Are you hearing the bass player? What are what are his notes? Are you in his way? Mm -hmm. Are you rushing or are you behind Dave? What what are what are the horns? How are they voiced? Are you hearing those stabs? Are you augmenting those stabs to the point to to where the harmony isn't right? You know, mm -hmm. are you playing a flat nine when it shouldn't be? It should be a raised nine because you like the passing, you know. Uh that's the thing. So it's you know, like when I play with this band, I play with the band. I play with the other players. I listen intently to the other players. Uh, I take on the role and I, I deem it my job to hold the suit down. Right. You know, to be, you know, there's those chords will always be there. So when we come to a passage, it won't be something out of the ordinary. I'm not going to noodle and play around and solo within a within the group just to just because. Right. That's not me. Uh, I think my job in this band is to keep it right there, just like be the rule, like a good gumbo. Right. You know, and that's what I try to do every time I get on stage with Tower of Power. I, I was talking with Jerry about that a little bit, how he was describing the same thing you were just describing and how to fit in that groove and be your voice and heard, yet not get any in anybody's way and how there's so much going on. Yes. When you listen to the grooves, there's so much going on. How do you fit and how you described it? It was exactly right. How do you fit within that and not get in anybody's way and still do your own thing? And how do you make it all groove? And it's phenomenal. It isn't something that anybody can just walk in and do. I mean, no, it, 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 it took me, <laughs> it took a, <laughs> took me a year in this band to figure out how to, you know, congeal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't realize at times I was overplaying. I didn't realize I was stepping on people. The things that I just described, I had to learn, you know, that I've been teaching other kids. Um, 
I had to learn that the hard way. You know, what are you playing? What was that? Don't do this. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, they, they never said play what Chester played. Nobody ever said do uh, Chester did it like this. Why don't you do it like that? Not once mm. did any of the players in this group ever come to me like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to find my own voice based on that gigantic footprint of Chester Thompson's. And that's pretty damn formidable. I mean, to this day, uh, those first four or five records are, you know, not uh, excluding the uh, East Bay Greece, mm -hmm. but the second, third, and fourth. Right. In my opinion, my humble opinion, that's quintessential, man. That's absolutely. That's everything. Uh, you know, like if, if everything he's doing is everything I want to hear. Yeah. So when I go out to play, I try to emulate as much as possible, even though I can't because I'm not Chester. Right. But I will do my own to keep that footprint in mind and in the in the minds of the listening audience. Right. You right. know, and, and that's for me a nightly challenge when I play. Well, well you do it. You do a superb job of it, my friend. You. <laughs> you <laughs> You, you and this is what I kind of want to fast forward a little bit from from the time you first started till now and and what I think and this is just just my opinion I agree with you about those three albums as being the the quintessential tower of power that was that was the sound and the voice that sort of started the whole thing however the latest couple of records really is is so relevant and so good and this uh group of guys together right now you've all been together for a while with mark kind of in and out of the band a little bit but you guys now have been such a solid group and are kind of at the you're really tight and you're it feels like something new and at the top of your game you're playing all that old stuff but here's tower of power with a new voice if yeah, sense, it's almost like you've reinvented the band and it's relevant, even though that old stuff is still cool. Those new songs are are like, OK, here we go. This is it's on. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. It's, um, you know, like uh, when we started the record. Uh, you know, we uh, oh, just like East Bay, um, East Bay um, in uh, Oakland all the way. Right. Um, you know, I challenged Dave and Rocco to go back to the um, uh, what's that song? Um, uh, oh, the the other bookends. Uh, the, oh man, gone. But uh, if you notice, East Bay, uh, the the intro, um, like Oakland Stroke. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, uh, that's the feel that I was going for when I wrote that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no organ chords, you know, uh, just a little bit, uh, other than the solo. And the organ part is dibba 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 about that and is that the um that's east bay that's what i opened with is that correct yeah. east bay all day yeah east bay mm -hmm. so, just because on, on the uh, on the uh, the first the first uh record not on step up no oh okay so when i i had this brilliant idea if i can if i can get it because you're describing it mm -hmm. if i was able to actually play that okay um Let's see, it should be on step up, but yeah, it is on step up. East Bay it's, all day, but this is this is off of, of yeah, yeah. uh soul side of town. Yeah. Here it comes. Hey, 
sorry, I just have to listen. So, I, there were no chords in there. No. There were just you playing notes. Yeah, uh, that's all it is. You can hear the organ in the back. That's how the whole thing started. Then um, uh, it, it kind of gets swallowed up. But uh, if you were to hear just the raw tracks, you yeah. get what I would deem an emulation of that quintessential stuff that Tower was doing back in the day. Right. But at the same time, to if you what we were talking about in terms of groove now you know a lot of people might be tuning in and not really find what we're talking about interesting but if there are musicians and tower of power is a musician's band i mean if you cannot be you cannot be a musician and not know about tower of power you know what <laughs> i mean <laughs> was yeah. like, sorry. i'm sorry but um what we were talking about groove and all of the stuff going on in that song there's so much stuff going on, but it's grooving and fitting and nobody's in each other's way. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, like uh, this, that is a well, that's a very produced track. Well, um, yeah. And there are a lot of things added in it, like the timbales and a lot of different things that live you'd never hear because we don't have a timbale player. But uh, uh, in producing that, you know, uh, th there was some, um, there have been and there is a lot of stacking uh, mm. in terms of parts right um so you know you really have to put your ear close to it to hear some of the the, stuff the, the root yeah right. right well so speaking of of things uh and i kind of want to do this if you can bear with me. Mm -hmm. you sent me um you sent me some of your stuff some of your record yeah Right. Uh, I, I did. Say, uh, this, I, I kind of like this, how this started. And tell me, tell me about this. Man, what's going on? Man, what's up, Whispers? Man. <laughs> you doing, man? Just get up in this club, yeah, hey, man, man, I'm trying to get up in here, man, at night because they're going to be pumping, man. <laughs> hey, man, is that Roger over there? <laughs> I think that's man. man, that's what they hit in the night. In 15 minutes. Hold up. Wait a minute, let me put some pimping in it, girl. I'm thinking while I'm drinking, the way you walking, girl, is stinking. You so funky, just like the groove I hear. Give me your hands on. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it out. Yeah, I just wanted to tell. tell <laughs> well, uh, actually, you know that song. Uh, was initially titled Vega. I wrote that for the bassist Bobby Vega, mm. uh, uh, bass player Phenom out of the Bay Area. Um, and uh, it was totally different than that. And I decided, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to flip the script on it and make it a, a fun, kind of a, you know, funkadelic parliamental, you know, right. groove thing. Right. And um, uh, Marcus Scott just happened to be in Sacramento and he happened to be at my house. We were out the winery all day. So we come right. back and he just kind of just came up with some lyrics. I said, come on, Marcus. I got him in the studio <laughs> late night. And that's what we came up with. Oh, nice. And that's Marcus singing. That's Marcus singing. Yeah. That dude is bad. I mean, he yeah. is. He's amazing. All right. So is are you going to be putting out a new record, a new album of some of this stuff? Uh, well, I, I think I may have sent you a couple of snippets, but um, uh, the stuff that you have now, it that's out. That's on my latest CD. It's called Just Another Day. Right. And that's been out for several months. Is this song? Yeah. I that's Just Another Day. Right.
basically just two of us <laughs> yeah it's uh rachel santos did the lead vocals lead vocals she's uh she's a nashvilleite fabulous this girl is very talented wow. and uh derek doa allen and myself that's it wow that's amazing so uh while i'm thinking of because that made me now that you said you were playing basically everything i've got a picture here that i'm going to put up uh, with you and Jacob Collier. Oh. <laughs> so tell me, tell me how that experience was. Uh, Jacob, man, man, that's, that guy's like a, a one man beehive. <laughs> he is absolutely amazing. We, uh, the entire band met him. I think it was in Cheltenham, England, uh, at a, I forget the name of the studio, but it's very famous there in Cheltenham. And uh, we spent the entire day uh, working on a song with him that he had written. Uh, and um, it was intense. Uh, he knew exactly what he wanted from the group and uh, what he was trying to say. He worked the horns. He worked Dave, worked us all. But wow. uh, I can't wait to hear what his end result is and how he uses those tracks. But mm -hmm. it was amazing. The guy, the kid is, he's unbelievable. Plays everything. Right, right. Everything. So uh, now I had my buddy on, on uh, when, when Tom, when I know Tom's tuning in. So I've, I've got this picture here. This is a picture of you and Tommy. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So I got a picture of you and Tommy. And then uh, I, you, I'm just going to go through some of these pictures you sent me. Um, and then uh, here's a picture of you and Dr. John. Yeah. And and how long ago was that? Oh, that was, uh, oh, goodness. I see, he died too, at least close to seven years ago, maybe five, seven years ago. I don't remember now. Yeah, that was in, uh, that was at the House of Blues in New Orleans. Mm. And then uh, I've got a picture of you and um, Maceo Parker. Uh, that was in Germany. Wow. Yeah. And then there's a picture of you and Tom Jones. Uh, let's see here. I think that was in, that was at Montro Jazz Fest. It was, did, did he sing? Was he performing? Yeah, Tom, Tom was a headliner. Wow. How's he, I mean, he's he's got to be pretty old these days. But, you know, the guy is... Still bringing it, man. He's, All right. he's Tom. Still bringing it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I've got a picture of you in front of uh, the Royal Albert Hall. That was amazing. That was um, incognito uh, open for us that night. Um, I had not been at the Royal Albert Hall since I was in Europe with Jeff Beck. Wow. But and Jeff Beck, uh, I'm I'm sorry that that just 
Blow by Blow was one of my favorite albums ever. And the fact that you met him back then and played with him, and I, you, I'm still, I've put you even further up on the pedestal, pedestal my friend. It's like, <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. dude, really? <laughs> All right. So then um, I've got a picture, and I'm not sure who the guy is. He's in a gray shirt um, standing next to you. Okay, let's see. And that comes up. Yeah, it's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, it's okay. Just get the guy with the red T-shirt out of there. That's all. <laughs> oh, oh, that's that's one of my heroes. Good oh, man. I, I'm um, that that one hurts. That's Lyle Mays. Oh, I didn't even recognize him. That's Lyle Mays. Oh man. Yeah. And that was at um, North Sea Jazz Festival. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we had a blast with them. And I think uh, Jerry has a picture with them, too. I think yeah, we all we were just huggy, huggy. <laughs> you know, it yeah. was amazing. He got off the piano and man, because I'd met him before a couple of three or four times. And uh, uh, yeah. I, I miss that man. He's uh, yeah. just a genius, man. Yeah. I yeah, I, nothing. You can't say anything more. <laughs> mm -hmm. The picture you sent me is with uh, I believe it's Herman Matthews and you in the background. That's a great shot. Uh, that must have been one of our yeah when he was taking Dave's place. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see when it comes up. I'll tell you about it. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. That was probably on the East Coast. And I don't know the exact venue. Could have been Martha's Vineyard up there someplace. I'm not sure, but I know it was it was on the East Coast, the East Coast run we were doing that. Uh he's such a powerhouse, such his energy, his vibe, and his groove is undeniable. It's fast. And we we had a blast, man. We had a blast. That's the Herminator, man. Yeah, yeah. He's one great. and only Herminator. Right, right. Uh, I did sound for an event uh, for the Rose Bowl when the uh, that movie uh, 27 start, start, whatever that is with Darlene Love and all those people. And Herman was in the band, played behind those four girls. They were going to sing Open the Rose Bowl that year. And mm -hmm. the sound of the band and those girls that, that sang in that, it was it was just amazing i've i had so much fun doing sound for them so the next thing i'm putting up though is and this is uh, another thing we want to make sure we get in tonight is this whole thing with your bump city winery <laughs> and so uh i've got a picture of bump city with a red label on a keyboard oh yeah that one uh frank anzalone took that shot of the bump city red one of our um uh, that might have been vintage 2014, maybe. Not sure. Uh, can't see the date on it. Yeah, so he placed it on B3 and took a good shot of it. So that's one of our our marketing shots for the uh, for for my winery. And okay, here it is. I find it. I got it. Okay, so I've got. I put up the uh, the winery. So tell me a little bit about the winery. I I, I tried to pull off a bunch of uh, photos of the different kinds of wine that you guys have. So. Uh, tell me about your winery, Bump City Wine Company. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's B Bump City Wine Company and yeah. um, started it about five years ago, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, our entire uh, vineyard, 1,700 acres in Sonoma and up around the Russian River. And uh, we do just about every varietal. Uh, right now on, on our docket, we have our Bump City Red. We have a Cabernet. We have a Tempranillo, we have a Pinot Noir, we have a, a Spanish varietal called Albarino. We have a Sauvignon Blanc, we have Chardonnay, uh, we have Pinot Grigio, and we also have uh, a Ruby Solero Port that we offer. Wow. So I, I kind of pulled off a few pictures of some wines, and I don't know whether I, I, I wish I could have. <laughs> that, that's a Pinot Noir you're looking at now. Oh, okay um uh so is that uh sort of your new passion your your hobby when you're not doing tower you are at the winery yeah well it's uh it's a little beyond a hobby uh 
<laughs> it's a, it's definitely a full blown business. Uh, we, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of work involved in it. Uh, luckily I have a great partner when I'm on the road. Uh, he handles the whole thing. My partner, Mike Smolich, um, when I first got the offer to do this thing, I knew that, uh, when it came down my, my lane, I went, Oh man, I'm a musician. What do I know about retail business, let alone wine retail business? I love wine. Uh, I, I like good wines. I like wines from around the world. I understand it. I get it. But to be in business and procure it, bottle it, put it in barrel, do the vending, and oh man, I, you know, it, it, but even doing that, but getting it together retail wise. Mm. Uh, and putting all that together and making sure that uh, your business is Trump tight. I needed someone to do that with me. Uh, my partner, Mike, was in business. He owned his own businesses for uh, forever. And he's been my dear friend, our dear friend, for over 35 years. Uh, so I called him up. He's retired. He's just hanging out at his house and, and digging, uh, you know, out by the lake. And so I asked him, say, hey, Mike, you want to go in the wine business? He goes, sure. And I went, thank God, savior. You know, I found myself a boss, somebody who knows how to uh, get through all the ins and outs of retail. And uh, with his help, uh, together, we've formed this company and uh, built it to uh, well over uh, 12, almost 1,500 wine club members in five years. Wow. Well, that's that's a substantial business now. And how how has the uh, drought and any of that has that affected the any of the crops or anything? Well, you know, you always have your ins and outs. Ours is not so much the drought; it's been the fires. Uh, but oh. we've been fortunate enough to where our our property hasn't been affected to that degree. Uh, even when it, we had the uh, substantial flooding, only one or two lots got more water than they should have. It dried pretty quickly. The grapes came out really fat and juicy, a lot of sugar. But uh, we were lucky. You know, they didn't get diseased, and we really weren't shorted uh, in terms of juice and uh, tonnage. Mm. Uh, I don't. I know nothing about wine, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> all of this stuff. It it makes sense it, it, that every time, every grape, every harvest, the the grapes have a different taste. Is that? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one, one amazing thing you can have, oh, let's say you got an acre lot here, have a half acre over here, right next to each other. You got, a, you, know, you know, like uh, two acres mm -hmm. or an acre and a half, and they're right next to each other, and they can be the same varietal. Cabernet here, Cabernet here. Right. They both grow at the same time, but you harvest this one, you harvest this one, and you do the same vending at the same time, you put them in a barrel at the same time, you bottle it at the same time, and you taste it from the North Vineyard, taste it from the South Vineyard. And I'll be damned if you don't get a totally different taste profile, totally different character in each bottle of wine, just based on 10 feet away from each other. Wow. It's amazing. And, and do you have do you have somebody that officially sort of an official taster of how this stuff is supposed to go, or is that just something that you do? Or? Well, we have a, we have our winemaker's name is Nori Nakamura. Mm -hmm. uh, he has guided us through everything, and uh, with his help, we've garnered several awards with our wines from day one. Uh, so yes, to answer your question. Okay, and then uh, Bump City is I know that's from. Did you take that from the Tower of Power, Bump City? Yeah, well, I was thinking about what I wanted to name the company. And, you know, I said, hey, Bump City Wine Company. I'm in the band, you know. Uh, so, well, you know, just put it bluntly, why not just piggyback and hitchhike off that, you know, and see what happens. You know, first it was just going to, we weren't going to, we weren't thinking of it being as big as it is now. Mm. Um, uh, so I went ahead and, uh, and, uh, check the availability of Bump City and found out that nobody owned it. So, <laughs> hello. <laughs> so uh, the trademark is mine. Bump okay. City is mine. That's fantastic. So um, generally, I'd like to try to keep these uh, interviews about an hour. And we initially thought we were going to 
I was going to get it, have you play a little bit, mm-hmm. but you know, we had a little bit of a snag with the, uh, the phones and everything, but this has worked out really well because I was able to talk to you and, and just find out all kinds of things about you. And I know there, there must be a lot of fans out there of tower of power. Like, wow, he, he has a winery, you know, maybe <laughs> some people like, I want to buy some wine tomorrow. And, um, uh, if, if I take us out on a tune, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I've got of the ones you sent me, which one do you think I should play? Mr. Oh man. <laughs> I, got, I forgot what I even sent you, man. <laughs> I sent you so much. Uh, I, I've how about, all- uh, oh, 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 oh. One of my favorites, uh, because George Duke is one was one of my mentors. Mm-hmm. And I took one of his songs and flipped it. Uh not only that one, oh, oh, there's another one. Uh off, of, off my latest record. It's called South Side of Heavy. That's the last one I have downloaded here, and I love that. Should we should we listen to that on our way? Yeah, out? And, and by the way, for everybody, that's uh, Tony Lindsay singing lead. Tony Lindsay was mm-hmm. Santana's lead vocalist for over twenty five years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, coming from the Bay Area, you're from mm-hmm. the, the Bay Area, or at least Northern California. Yeah. Jared, the, Bay Area, the whole band, pretty much from the Bay Area. Nobody. Uh, has lived in the Bay Area and not know who Tony Lindsay is. That's true. You know, it's a pretty small group of people up there from from way back. You know, it, it's the Bay Area has its own thing. And if yeah. you're from the area, you know who they are. <laughs> That's true. It's, you know, like Northern California, I look at it like this. From Fresno or Bakersfield, I'm sorry, Bakersfield North all the way up to Eureka and West. That's mm-hmm. it. Yeah, that's it. You know, you can't all the way down the valley, Fresno, Dinuba, Visalia, Hanford, Tulare, those little bitty towns, man. You know, it's T.O.P. is synonymous and and Santana, you know, all those groups. Right. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, uh, There was a a couple of groups that came up uh, that started way back in then i I just had a a photographer on last week pat johnson that grew up taking photos of his first major gig was the photographer for the record company that was uh behind journey and that's that's how he got his start so he was around the bay area uh, as tower of power was and jefferson starship and and journey and all those bands so there's there's a real uh, a group of musicians and bands from the Bay Area that are are will live forever from the Bay Area. I'm a little sad that some of that is disappearing these days. Well, you know, it's it's amazing. And tell me if I'm wrong or not. You know, I get in the Bay. You have about ten different places, five to ten clubs that everybody is circulating around. Mm-hmm. In Sacramento, you have none. Right maybe one or two uh but everybody leaves and and now you know when they introduce this ab5 which i think i'm not yeah uh, uh, part of my ignorance on it i'm not sure exactly where that's sitting with the legislature if it's passed squashed somebody will correct me on that i'm sure but um those actually i was talking to some people about that this last week we're not really sure how it's all going to turn out yet yeah yeah you know it's bad enough that you know like we're dealing with this pandemic mm-hmm. and everything is shut down um I, I just wish the best for all my musical buddies uh all my guys that i've grown up with that play for a living you know be it sitting in a coffee shop with a single guitar with tips uh and now it's gone right you know so i just uh my heart breaks for him you know because i don't i try to do what i can but not much you know we can't even get together in my studio to no. record <laughs> exactly and uh i know this we're going a little long but i'm, I'm thinking that people will bear, bear with us because uh i think recently the pandemic has actually brought to light the gigging musician a little bit more than they used to be but i still don't know if people are really aware of what you just described the guitar player that just wants to play guitar and he's playing at the coffee shop and he's making money and that's his in a lot of ways his living and he has aspirations of being able to do something good and he might be a great player that 
nobody ever hears, but he loves playing his guitar and all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah. And there, there are hundreds, if not thousands of those kinds of musicians that don't have the successes or have the opportunities of some of us, but it doesn't mean they're any less of a musician or they're, income is any less valuable than any absolutely other. absolutely man um you know it's a it, it's just a, a sad state i i just uh you know now you know it, what we're doing now i'm finding that um not only am i sitting in here you know talking to you on your show but a lot of my fellow musicians have discovered the fact that they could so sustain themselves if they operated properly via right. the internet right. over and the airwaves. Uh, and I'm finding so many guys, every time I go on Facebook or just log in, you know, so many musicians that I would never think I'd ever see doing this are doing it. Right. Even Steve Vai, I mean, right. for God's sakes, uh, you yeah. know, Bob James is even on it. Right. And, you know, it's amazing to me. It's a different world. It's a different, it's just a different time, man. It is. You know. Everybody, all of the musicians need to do it and need to develop their own fan base. And what I'm hoping is you can monetize YouTube. I'm actually going to have a guy on tomorrow I'll talk about this. Yes. Monetize yeah. YouTube, but you cannot monetize Facebook. And, Facebook, no. Right. And you're also limited if developing friends. You can only have 5,000 friends. So the the open platform of Facebook is what you what I'm trying to do in it at least is if I have you on and I have Tom on and all your friends see this then I have a guitar player that somebody else uh, you know like Jerry by the time all the friends from all the people start tuning in to YouTube or to uh, Facebook they start seeing oh wait oh there's that there's that keyboard player oh he's got a great oh he's Tower of Power oh he's got a great CD and then they start searching you and we're all going to have to learn how to navigate the internet now yeah. in the way in order and who who knows how long this is going to go it could go for six months and at six yeah. months a bunch of us are like forget it we're out on the streets yeah it, it's amazing you know like with you know I, you know listening to the medical experts and uh there, you know, the, the, the conflicting stories all the way around, mm -hmm. which boils down to nobody knows a damn thing right? as to a timeline right. uh, or like if you feel as if you might want to go get checked just because you're around family, like I have a 92 year old mom. And uh, so, uh, you know, and I have allergies really bad, too. So. Right. You know, am I okay? And uh, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, and I'm still on medication for cancer. So, uh, oh it's so many things that you don't know. I want to go get tested. How long will it take for the results? Can I get tested? Where can I get tested? Um, right. How long will it take for the results? Ten days? Fifteen days? Ten minutes? Twenty minutes? You know, uh, is the test viable? I, you know, nobody knows a damn thing. No, so. No. It's not just logistical. It's not just worldwide. I think it's a mental pandemic that's being thrown uh, down on us now. <laughs> everybody's uh, everybody's afraid, uptight, insecure, not knowing, uh, yeah. just kind of wandering. And, and, it, and it, it, like it brings to a point what you said, the timeline. How mm -hmm. long? Two months? Three months? Yeah. You know, you can't really put a nickel on it. But on a positive note, I've been seeing some very talented guys on the internet, extremely talented musicians, and it's great to see them kind of up close and personal, if you will. Right. You know, uh, like you would never ever see them before. And right. uh, for that, I'm grateful, you know, just to be able to see and get to know these guys that I thought I knew, but now, wow, you did, wow, I like that. Right. You know, right. The, the uh -huh. silver lining that I'm seeing right now is mm -hmm. everything has slowed down enough that you and I have enough time to sit and do this for an hour. Yeah. Other people have enough time to sit and listen and learn about you. Uh, we have enough time to talk to people on the phone when we haven't talked to people on the phone for a long time. That's true, true. In our 
we're taking time to actually reach out to people and call on the phone. Now, here's here's this one. Check out this. This is why I started thinking. Do you remember when we were younger and everything signed vaguely? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. All right. That's right. I'm only 20. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was a time when everything closed up at 10 or at yes. 11, right? Everything closed at 10 or 11 and they were closed on Sundays. Well, you know what's happening now? Everything's closing at nine or 10. Dude. Everything's closing on the weekends. And it's sort of like it was way back when. It, you know, and it, everything's slowing down. Nobody's, everybody's taking their time. They're spending time talking to each other. They're not in a hurry to race here and race there. So from a silver lining point of view, we're actually reaching out and connecting a little bit more. We're having to use the internet to do it, but we're actually connecting and talking more, I think. Yeah, yeah we are. And um, that's amazing to me. Um, you know, like it's, because yeah. that kind of communication, I, I, I do miss the personal thing yeah, uh, because I, I'm, you know, like, uh, like if you were with me now, I'd, I, you know, we'd be working in the studio together to right. put this together. Now I'm doing it, sending tracks here, getting them back, trying to do it on FaceTime so we can get an idea as to what we're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's so such another learning curve for me, <laughs> you know. It is, you know, a lot of people yeah. are trying to perform together over over FaceTime and stuff, and it's going to be impossible because they're going to discover that there's mm -hmm. a see that you cannot avoid. You cannot, <clears throat> like, there's enough a delay between you and me, no matter what platform we use, that you, we can't play together through this sort of FaceTiming kind of thing. We're yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, I mean, what do they have? You know, I'm not going to try to sell up on any like uh, another platform like zoom or whatever right but uh i understand that you can buy the major corporate account in zoom where you purchase enough bandwidth right that you, you know? need a lot of bandwidth in order to get yeah. latency and that exactly. takes a lot of money it does <laughs> All right. So Roger, we've been going for an hour and 12 minutes and I, you know, I could talk to you forever and, and uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I uh, thank you for taking some time to talk with me. And, well, it was my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to take everybody out on uh, the South side and South side of heavy. Correct. And uh, we'll listen to that. And then I'll slowly close us out. It's all right. It's outside of heavy rescue. Southside of heaven, send me. Southside of heaven, I surrender. There's no wind blowing my direction. I'm on the south side of heaven on my own. There's just a shadow standing there beside me to remind me on this road. Long, long ways from home is where I'm home because I'm on the south side. South side of heavy. But I want to be on the north side. South side of heavy. South side of heavy. Inside. 
Tell me why do, why do, why do I have to be all alone? Mm-hmm. On the south side, I'm heavy on my own. Standing there behind me to remind me on this road. Oh, I'm feeling all alone. Oh, baby, I'm on the south side of your love. Yes, I am. South side of heaven. I don't want to be on the south side. Oh, no. oh, baby, I'm begging you, you, yes, I am. Oh. Yes, I am. Yeah. Ha, ha. Let me tell you, I remember. 